Welcome to this week's version of 60 Minutes by Vethenskops Forum COVID-19. This week we have a very special guest in Eric Feigelding, Dr. Eric Feigelding, a world-renowned epidemiologist, and he's world-renowned because he warned the world in January 2020 of what was to come. And many people thought that he was overreacting, and in fact, we all found out that he was not. Uh, he has close to 600,000 followers on Twitter, which is a main forum which many news people follow, and and uh, and he, he puts out uh, constantly puts out threads on new information. Uh, much of it's about the United States, but also about the world, uh, and 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 it's always good to follow it. Um, he has a Facebook page that has 5 million people on it, but he prefers the Twitter account, so this is what he's mainly pushing for. Uh, I want to point out that he doesn't monetize anything, okay? He's not making money out of doing this. This is something, this is public service. Again, he's a, a epidemi Harvard-trained epidemiologist. Is that correct, Eric? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and currently located and speaking to us from Washington, D.C., if I remember it right. And right. so uh, we have questions from the audience that we're going to start up with, and questions are welcome during the show. Uh, <clears throat> so the first question I have, and it's actually from me, is, is uh, in January 2020, you were among the first to point out the level of what the world was in for, as I said a few minutes ago. You know, I remember, I, I've been reminded several times by my karate class that at the same time, I said this would spread around the world and that they should think about that. But I didn't really think to get active for a while. I sort of was trusting and thought everything would go OK, that, that the governments would come in and, and do what was needed. Uh, what led you to the conclusions you made and what drove you to lead this charge to inform and try to save the world? Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Andy, for having me here. And that's a very loaded question and it's very deep, but obviously we're a year and a half into this pandemic or more, uh, much longer than a year and a half now. And it's very frustrating that we're still here. I think in January, you know, I was frustrated because the people who were kind of precautious and, you know, I'm part of the precautionary principle led uh, scientific, scientific communicator. People were just not listening to them. There was only a few scattered reports of some outbreak in China. The world was ignoring it. Um, and WHO kind of actually punted on declaring a public health emergency international concern in one of their meetings in the third week of January. And I was just extremely uh, infuriated by that. All the while, the data coming out from China was you know, really disturbing. And a lot of a lot of Western scientists who don't have their ears to China because they don't understand China. Uh, I was born there. I came to the United States when I was very young. But they don't understand China. And whenever China has, there's some sort of commotion in China, the government quickly clamps down on it when it has a strategy, when it knows what's going on. But in certain ways, the, the data was so disturbing. Uh, and the anecdotes were real. They're not just some social media conspiracy. And that China had no message control. They, e even for the later on, the, the whistleblower doctor, they try to silence, but then they try to save and admit that he's not dead, but then he eventually he died. It had no message control. That tells you that this is serious and is out of, and completely out of control. And then of course, the preprints started finally coming out, showing the R naught of 3.8. And 3.8 is just incredibly scary of an R naught, uh, given that an, this 3.8 can quickly spread around the world if people don't take action. Um, and that's why I, I, I've seen this kind of phenomenon happen in which people act too late. People dismiss the risks until it's too late. And so, uh, you know, in, in a former life, I was. Uh, whistleblower on drug, uh, certain drugs, pharmaceutical drugs that were dangerous, uh, that were ignored, um, and then flint lead poisoning, and even um, certain, you know, blood testing um, uh, 
uh, companies like Theranos that I tried to whistleblow, but it was, was, it was ignored until it was too late. So I decided, you know, this, this is a thermonuclear level bad pandemic potential. And of course, there's a lot of hate, but the, the data was clearly there. And soon I, I was trying to lead the charge because I, at first, my mission was make the WHO declare public health emergency international concern because they punted on it the, a few days before, the week prior, but you had to act. Uh, and as Dr. Mike Ryan of WHO famously said, in this pandemic, if you want to be absolutely certain that you're right before you act, you will lose against this pandemic. You know, the perfection is the enemy um, uh, here in, in pandemic management. So I went for it. And in certain ways, I know how to communicate to millions of people because I've had large social media platforms before, um, which I've used. But, you know, I think this is a very unique moment in time. And I think, you know, there's not enough people screaming for people to get prepared and they, you know, I'm not that effective, clearly. And here we are still a year and a half later. But I think the information right now is just more important than ever, especially to fight the disinformation and misinformation. Yeah, it seems to be getting worse. So, I mean, it just it seems like all, like the sways back and forth between the precautionary side and the let it rip Great Barrington side. And, and right yeah. now it seems to be swaying towards the Great Barrington side. Yeah, I think yeah, the that political of the political powers that try to drive some of these narratives of everything is fine, natural infection is fine, it's not. Children are fine, it's not. Long COVID is not real, it's real. You know, all these things, a reinfection doesn't happen, it happens. Uh, it's not airborne, <laughs> it's air you don't need a mask, <laughs> we need a mask. Like all these things that were, some people have been consistently wrong always 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 repeatedly and that acts actually endangered the, the the downplaying people there are some people who are innocent downplayers who don't know better and then there are people who should know better like yeah. swedish epidemic chief everything else technol he should know better the data and out there from all these other other ministries of health have been saying it is dangerous it is a clear and present danger so those who should know better but downplay it, I think, are more responsible than the innocent people who don't understand it out there. Yeah. Well, I have a question from an Anna Robinson, and she says, Dr. Fagelding, why do you think it is, is, it is that all countries are not applying the New Zealand strategy? To her, it's incomprehensible. Yeah, the New Zealand strategy is basically the zero COVID strategy, which I've advocated for a long time. And I think last year, the best approach was definitely the New Zealand strategy. Um, but I think, no. first of all, some countries are way too porous. Um, I think New Zealand strategy can be used. And some people say, oh, it's only high wealth countries. That's not true. Vietnam is a very you know, middle, lower middle income country. It pride the zero COVID New Zealand strategy on containment, testing, quarantine. But many other countries, they want to put their market uh, activity and commerce and tourism first. And of course, that leads to, you know, just complete abomination in terms of outcomes. Um, and, you know, some people just, there. it's... It's very, remember the movie Inconvenient Truth, um, you know, about climate change? There's many things in which, if you believe one side, it's very convenient to think this will all be fine. Kids won't be infected. Kids got infected and they got sick. They just didn't get um, uh, tested as much last year. Uh, and now the variants, B117, and now especially Delta affects children even more, more and much more severely than last year. I think people just ignore the the inconvenient things. Oh, I have to cancel this? No, no, no. It can't be true. I'm going to believe the the facts or the the side uh, data that people cherry pick that shows there's no real risk. Yeah. You know, you cherry people want to cherry pick things that conform to their ideology and conform to their convenience 
that, oh, we don't need to cancel weddings. Weddings are fine. You know, we don't wear, need to wear masks. The wedding masks are fine. We, we know lockdowns save lives. And it's like, well, it hurts the economy, lockdown. But you know what? Here's the truth. They did analysis. It's not that the lockdowns caused the economic drop. They only did a little bit. The main thing that caused the economic drop was deaths and hospitalizations rising and people fearing the pandemic. Because, you know, it's kind of like if you open Jurassic Park, but there's one velociraptor roaming, are people going to come to the park? If people knew that there's one rattlesnake or lion loose in the uh, zoo, are people going to come to the park? No, people are not. And the, the analysis sh clearly show that the main driver for the economic drop in activity was the rise of the virus and the deaths, especially the deaths and hospitalizations. That was, so it basically it was the pandemic, it was the virus that killed their economy, not the lockdowns, not the quarantines that killed the economy. And, but, you know, people want to think that, oh, if we kept the doors open, people will come. No, if you keep, even if you kept the doors open in a pandemic, when people are dying, and hospitalized, people are not going to come. And there's this wishful thinking that, oh, if we just kept things open, it, everything will be fine. It's not. And Sweden kept things open uh, more laissez-faire than compared to its Scandinavian neighbors like you know Norway, Finland, Denmark, Iceland. And Sweden had way more deaths. It's in terms of uh, excess deaths is one of the highest deaths, excess deaths a year since uh, the 2018 pandemic. And it had no real gain in economic benefit. Its GDP uh, growth was no better than its neighbors who locked down and took the precautionary principle. But in the moment, <laughs> it's very convenient to think that, oh, if we just kept the things open, everything will keep smooth uh, sailing, sailing smoothly. But, you know, the inconvenient truth is that COVID, you cannot ignore it. If you do, it's at either the peril of your economy or the peril of your population, yeah. which is your economy. And, and a beautiful study came out in 2000, uh, 2020 in March, they published from MIT, and I didn't put that, put the news article because it has a headline, but it's the data speak, stronger pandemic response yields better economy. They studied the 1918 flu pandemic and showed that US cities that responded more aggressively also had better economic rebounds. It's a wonderful study to read. Uh, so it's exactly the point you're making, and uh, and I think it's 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 really sad that that so many governments just don't seem to pick pick up on this. Um, yeah. Okay, but so uh, so Mariella Nielsen asks: For a given country, what are the essential steps to achieve a zero COVID strategy? She also wonders how population density affects the spread of disease. If we compare one country and another four times the population density, how much worse would the situation be? Yeah, I'll, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm going to take the population density question first. People mm -hmm. thought, remember in the New York City surge in April and May last year were huge deaths? The rest of the U.S. thought, oh, New York City is just so hyper dense. You know, for us rural areas, we will be fine, totally fine. We're not, you know, um, a jam-packed like New York City is. But it turns out rural states like North and South Dakota, which are some of the most sparsely populated states, had one of the highest mortality, highest mortality. Uh, like one in 500 people died. Residents died, not infected, died. Um, and that was just, it's astronomical. And... And a lot of the South actually had really, really high deaths. And even right now, um, even if among the vaccinated states, you know, the New York City is doing much better than. So in terms of the population spread, it's not um, the density. I think in, when you're in a naive situation, um, it, obviously, when New York City didn't know what was happening, it makes a huge difference. But once if you just continue to ignore it, the virus will spread to in the rural areas because people aren't like basically occupying the corn fields and wheat fields of the Dakotas. People are still living and meeting each other in restaurants and 
you know, bowling alleys and nightclubs and, and, and these kind of church gatherings. Uh, it's the, the density actually doesn't really um, improve that much because think about it also right now. Also, by the way, the herd immunity thing, the, you know, there's natural infection and vaccine. The herd immunity thing, I don't actually don't think it works that as well as uh, the traditional models theorize because it assumes uh, that traditionally, say there's a big uh, ballroom of dancing people. Someone on the opposite side has a virus, you do not. But if most of the people in the dance floor in the middle of the ballroom are vaccinated, like, you know, the old number was 70%, then the chance of it hop skipping across the ballroom to you is low. That normally works. But A, you know, Delta is more contagious. And B, the issue is there is a population segregation where the anti-maskers and the anti-vaxxers, there's a big overlap in the Venn diagram, okay? They tend to cluster together. The precautionary masking and vaccinated people tend to cluster in a different uh, domain. So what happens is even if half of your population is vaccinated and wearing a mask, they're not equally mixing like in the in the dance floor analogy at the beginning. What happens is the anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers are going to their uh, you know nightclubs and their uh, parties together. While the the precautionary people either stay home or only cluster around other vaccinated people and only wear masks uh, among them. So in certain ways, you just take a certain state that's 50% or country that's 50% vaccinated. Um, just pretend these are all immune, and which they're not because there's um, breakthrough infections, which cause this leak. And we can get to that in a in sec, how the the breakthrough rates, you know, it, it is still problematic and the why you have to also mask even if vaccinated. But let's just put them aside. Even if you take the population density of Florida and divide it by two, right? Half the people who are vaccinated are just not, uh, not really um, in the equation. There's still plenty of people who are just among these pockets of unvaccinated, unmasked, who will continue to spread it. And so this is true, whether it's Florida or South Dakota or some very rural parts of, of, of a country where there's social, the, the, the social um, basically fractionalization of people who are unmasked and masked and vaccinated, um, unvaccinated creates a situation where the virus will still spread among this clusters of unvaccinated and unmasked people. So I don't think population density is the way to solve it, nor is it just relying on the traditional herd immunity model, which assumes everyone mixes evenly together. And therefore, uh, the high vaccination rate slows down the transmission in the unvaccinated. That's just not really happening anymore. Um, so I think first, I think it's a, it's a really good question. I don't think population density is a, it's a small predictor. I don't think it's a major factor. Um, and I think, you know, how do countries achieve zero COVID strategies? Well, you need multi-layers. You need vaccines. And now it's clear with Delta, we need boosters. But, but had we taken the uh, vaccine plus masking, and especially premium masks, um, and by the way, many European countries, um, well, higher income ones, mandate FFP2 masks, also known as can 95s KF94s that they use in Korea. These premium masks, um, in, or double masking, but obviously many people don't want to do that, plus ventilation of buildings and recognizing it's airborne. Recognizing many countries didn't recognize it was airborne until very late. And even now, there's still lots of outdated information that, oh, you don't need a mask unless you had symptoms. Half of all infections during COVID were due to asymptomatic people spreading it, especially among young people. The asymptomatic is spreading it. <sighs> you know, all these things. And then now ventilation, obviously, is not possible everywhere. So then you need disinfection where there's HEPA filters, um, UV, uh, MERV 13 filter upgrades. Obviously, this is much more for higher income countries. But all these things together, you layer them together, plus mass, plus testing, contact tracing. And testing is obviously important, but you also, part of testing's effectiveness is it leads to contact tracing. 
And contact tracing leads to quarantine and, uh, and isolation of those positive and quarantine of those close contacts. And of course, recognizing that the 15 minute rule for close contact, six feet, 15 minute, is not relevant because of airborne transmission. It's basically anywhere that the person was, was for almost any amount of time. Um, it doesn't have to be within six feet and doesn't have to take require 15 minutes. But obviously, you know, there's an inconvenience factor here. And this is where the, the uh, inconvenient truth is that this virus is so airborne that even if you use a bathroom and the bathroom is completely empty, it's a private bathroom, pu private public bathroom where you lock the door behind you, it's not safe because the prior person may not have worn masks. The, the, the flushing of toilet plumes we know has coronavirus aerosols that unless you have good ventilation and UV disinfection and HEPA filters, you're, th these bathrooms are still in danger. But you know, in the, uh, under the 15 minute uh, close contact rule, it's not. And of course, if you deny airborne, you know, it's convenient to just ignore that. And we are here because of the willfulness because the science was out there, the willful will, willingness to ignore inconvenient facts, inconvenient data points, especially on the precautionary side where there's lots of data emerging. Hmm, this could be true or it could be not true. But you know what? In the pan deadly pandemic, if you just assume that the worst case, that the virus is airborne, that the virus has asymptomatic transmission, that it stays in the air for many, many hours, right? If you just assume that they were true and taken measures early on to, to, uh, to mitigate and stop it, then this pandemic could have been controlled way early. Yeah. Um, and of course, border quarantines is the other key thing for country to country. Border quarantines is so important. And Australia and New Zealand uh, did it well, but Australia eventually also had very leaky on quarantine protocols where people basically socialize in these quarantine hotels. And a lot of transmission happened um, through these quarantine breaks. Um, but altogether, had we just taken a precautionary principle and done these multi-layer strategies, we could have stopped or slowed the pandemic by leaps and bounds. Yeah. Yeah, and Australia also had the problem with ventilation issues uh, in their hotel quarantine hotels. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they didn't recognize they, the airborne. Yeah, they didn't recognize it, as like Canada and Sweden and some others. Uh, Maria Torland asks about long COVID or post-COVID. And she, she says, you know, it's, it's some people seem don't seem to get better uh, for many months and, and reports claim from anywhere for 10 to 15 percent. Although if you look at organ damage, I would add, and it could be much higher. Don't notice yeah. it. Uh, of the people who are infected develop some kind of long-term issues. She asks, have there been any estimates made as to the long-term costs of post-COVID to society? Whew, that's, a, that's a very good question. So first of all, long COVID, our best estimate for pre-Delta estimate, because Delta is much more aggressive, was about one in eight adults and one in 12 children got long COVID based on symptomology. If you have asymptomatic long COVID, such as, you know, mild liver damage that doesn't immediately show up, we wouldn't really know about it. But I think also now that uh, Delta, it's also becoming much more aggressive. I think the long COVID is more than one in eight adults, one in 12 children now. Um, because Delta is, in the old days, the median date to first uh, positive test was about day six. Now it's day three point. 3.7. So it, it increased, it sped up by two days or more, right? Um, yeah. And on the first day that you test positive, according to Chinese data in Guangdong uh, CDC, it says that basically the viral loads are 1,000 times higher now with Delta. So they're two days faster and 1,000 times higher. Yeah. Just just uh, so it, it, in terms of actual viral load, it's likely much uh, higher if you keep it entirely apples to apples in terms of, you know, the same amount of uh, viral load buildup. Um, and so 
you know, it's much more aggressive. It's much more severe. The severity, it's about two and a half times more severe than Alpha B117 UK variant from Kent. But even that, uh, the B117 Alpha variant was 64% more severe than the original. So you multiply two and a half by 1.6, you get around upper threes or 4%, or 4X, not 4, 4%, four times more severe risk hospitalization. And Singapore also found 4.9 times greater uh, risk of hospitalization, oxygen use, and deaths as a composite measure overall, 4.9X compared to the original strain. That means that if it's that severe for these clinical outcomes, the long COVID is likely also more severe and frequent. We don't have good estimates yet because Delta is obviously so pretty new, but it's pretty damn serious. And, and the UK study uh, recently also on the British Intelligence Survey of 81,000 uh, adults surveyed shows that it was uh, it's clearly incredibly uh, also damaging uh, for cognitive function, like uh, intelligence. Like if you're ventilated, you lose seven IQ points. If you're hospitalized but not ventilated, uh, ventilator, you lose about uh, five or four. And But even if you're not hospitalized, you lose around like two to three points. It is incredibly, incredibly frustrating. So uh, I think these kind of cognitive things, we don't know how long they last. But um, it is it is definitely a very worrisome long term. Yeah, and the Oxford study showed you lose gray matter. That doesn't come back. Yeah. So yep. uh, okay, wow, uh, that, that's that's a great answer. I, 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 I also, I mean, can can you just quickly comment on viral load from vaccinated versus unvaccinated people? Because people are often very confused about this and don't realize that vaccinated people are transmitting. Yeah, th this is definitely happening. We know, you know, this is, we know it's it's been happening anecdotally before May. Yeah. And in June, the Singapore outbreak was the, I would say, the canary in the coal mine. Because Singapore Ministry of Health, has, as you know, Singapore is notoriously, well, famously, the one of the best contact tracing countries. And they found like huge and numerous clusters of uh, vaccinated people transmitting to unvaccinated, in which the chain clearly came from a vaccinated person. Um, and they had the testing for it, they have the tracing for it. And a lot of these vaccinated breakthroughs, like, you know, there was like two dozen or more of breakthrough uh, infections that led to a huge outbreak. And um, obviously we know that now from the, the also the, the Massachusetts um, Cape Cod uh, outbreaks in which uh, huge numbers of them were vaccinated. But even before then, we knew that these were transmitting and a lot of them were asymptomatically transmitting. And here's the other thing. There's something called the Peltzman effect in which in, a pu in public health and economics, if people believe they're immune, invulnerable, they behave more aggressively. Like if you wear a seatbelt and your car has airbags, people actually drive faster than if they didn't have airbags. And in HIV, uh, once HIV drug cocktails arrived, they were pretty good in drugs against HIV. Some of the HIV positive people became more promiscuous. Mm -hmm. And similarly here, if you're vaccinated and you're told incorrectly that you're immune and you can't transmit anymore and you don't need to wear masks, which is obviously what we now know was a very dangerous message, that you don't have to wear masks anymore, that you behave in a much more dangerous way. You don't, you stop taking precautions, you go to nightclubs again, right? Um, and this actually leads to more infections. And the same thing happens with a lot of, uh, you know, this accidents on the roadways when people think that their car is so much safer that they're not gonna die, they drive faster, get in more accidents. And same with HIV infections when they thought that, you know, their, their HIV cocktails would prevent them from you know spreading or or getting more severe disease. So in certain ways, the the, the message here, and a lot of the you know a lot of the CDC science, scientists are really academically trained, but they're not behavioral psychology and behavioral economically trained. And the message in terms of comms was completely wrong. That basically they fueled this. I don't need masks. And of course, the unvaccinated people 
or heard, oh, CDC says we don't need masks, even though CDC says you don't need masks if you're vaccinated. They just said we don't need masks, right? So that was a poor communications as well. But I think the, the breakthroughs, uh, we clearly know that there's breakthroughs, and the breakthroughs also happen um, the further uh, ago that you had gotten the vaccine, which Israel data clearly shows over six months, you have two times the breakthrough rates per capita, so it's adjusted. Um, and then someone who recently, more recently got it. All this data shows it is incredibly dangerous to tell people not to mask, and the breakthrough rates are, you know, although it protects them from hospitalization, which, by the way, the efficacy against Delta has dropped. It used to be against 99% against hospitalization for vaccines. It's now dropped to like 90-ish percent, low 90s percent against protection against hospitalization. That's not that good in terms of what I think is, um, you know, like, for example, instead of 100, 100 people get hospitalized, 10 people get hospitalized. That's what a 90% efficacy is, like uh, preventing 90% of that. That's not as good as what you think, because if I told you that, um, you know, you're the protection against your uh, this being landing in the hospital or dying is only 90% reduction, I don't think that parents would trust, uh, uh, you know, if their failure is one in 10 of a seatbelt or a car seat, I don't think parents would trust such a device to protect your children. No. Um, but that's what we're relying on right now. And so this is why the there is, a, again, we're in this weird situation, which lots of governments, even good uh you know, scientifically mind governments are saying, you know, oh, it's a good hospitalization prevention. It, the vaccine works. Well, the word works is a very vague word. It works, yes, for 90% reduction against hospitalization, you know, you know, 50, 60% re reduction in infection. But does it work enough to stop the pandemic? I don't know. Does it, is it enough to stop the hospitalization and deaths? I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if it's enough because you'll still have an incredibly high number of deaths and hospitalizations. Now, granted, most hot people hospitalized are unvaccinated, but that number is no longer 99%. And uh, that number's fallen in 90% places, 80% places, 70% in places. UK, uh, about a month ago, when I reported this, um, about 30% or 40% of people who are hospitalized were actually two-dose vaccinated. And a lot of uh, media uh, were actually told, a reporter actually told me that the UK government told them not to report that number anymore. Like, it's, is it accurate? Is it truthful? Yes, but don't highlight that number. And, and I think uh, because you, you'll fuel anti-vaxxers. No, but it's not that you're fueling anti You're actually misleading people that, um, that just relying on vaccines alone, because the, the the, you know, the people who want to think that we can reopen, their message right now is vaccinate and don't worry about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, to truly stop the pandemic, to truly stop the transmission, because we have huge numbers of people who are not vaccinated, huge numbers. To truly stop the pandemic, you actually have to do all these other things. Yeah. Once the pandemic is ended, yes, vaccines will be enough. When, while there's a raging pandemic, raging levels of Delta everywhere, you know, you can have just, again, if you just divide a, a country's population by half, I bet almost any country in the world, you divide it by half, you, South Dakota, North Dakota will still have um, fewer people per capita than even if those countries divide by half. But, you know, most countries are only about 50% vaccinated, 60% vaccinated. I guarantee you that deaths will still continue to climb especially yeah. among the unvaccinated. It will still come to climb because that we have not taken enough uh, mitigations, and that includes mitigations needed in the vaccinated to truly stop the spread. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people are getting the message wrong, that right now relying <clears throat> on vaccines is good, but it's not enough. I got you on a nerve on that one. I asked a quick question and you, you, you <laughs> that obviously that's had a nerve. I think that's important, uh, I, I, and I think it spreads to me because the children are not vaccinated almost anywhere here. Yes. If you're under 16, you're not vaccinated. And Annalie Alvin asked about the children's role in the pandemic, and I'm going to combine this with the question I have as well, because you've already talked about creating safe environments. But 
You tweeted yesterday an article on children infected in record numbers in the USA and children are dying from COVID more so in poor countries. Uh, but, but even in some places in the USA, children seem to be in peril and being hospitalized mm -hmm. a lot. And, uh, and a four-year-old died in Riverside in one of the articles I saw without any comorbidity, no underlying infections or anything or uh, comorbidities. Uh, if we have more infections, we have more deaths, even with children. Can you explain the math? I know I've seen you tweet on this. Yeah, so children, first of all, last year there was a lot of misinformation that children are less um, less uh, infected. Children got infected. They just, last year, they were more asymptomatic. But now with Delta, you know, the 1,000x higher viral load, children are much more symptomatic and naturally, you know, by progressively more severe. Uh, last year, there was just under-testing of children. So children definitely do get infected. And the data from uh, Ontario Public Health Department shows that young children actually spread more. They spread more than uh, older children uh, and teens. That was like a, that was actually pre-Delta. So with Delta, I think the, the ch children probably will spread even more than before. <sighs> Kids are not immune. Um, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Pediatric hospitalization per capita right now is higher than it was ever been last year. It's a pediatric hospitalizations are now like, I think like 20, 30% higher than last year's highest peak for a pediatric um, uh, uh, hospital missions among children under 17. That's really, really frustrating. Now, uh, in some countries, even though you know, the vaccine data is readily available among 12 to 15 year olds. Some countries are not vaccinating under 16 years old, which is really weird. UK's, there are a lot of people who are incredibly angry about this. Uh, you know, some people saying it's a lack of vaccine dose. No, no. First of all, you need to vaccinate kids because kids are naturally super spreaders, especially as schools restart. Um, and many schools have not restarted yet in parts of the world, parts of the US as well. And it's only going to get worse. Um, by the way, I want to remind people that UK is right now having its second Delta wave surge. Uh, UK had a lull for a little bit, uh, two, three weeks ago, but now cases and hospitalizations and deaths are rising again in the UK. And they attribute it to uh, schools reopening because children under 16 are not being vaccinated in the UK. Uh, even though vaccines for 12 and above are available uh, worldwide, um, for especially for developed countries. And... The, the, in certain ways, we definitely have to vaccinate children. We have to protect them. We have to wear a premium mask for kids, not just cloth masks, but premium masks. Can, the, the pediatric KF94, I have, for my kid, well, I got him a pediatric KF94 that actually has adjustable straps that you can tighten because the fit is just as important as a filtration. Um, I think kids should definitely wear premium masks, uh, HEPA filters, or just these horsey Rosenthal boxes based on four or five MERV 13 filters, um, just put them together into a, into a cube mm -hmm. uh, and with a box fan on top or on the side. And these filtration offers incredible amount of filtration for a classroom. So it costs less than $50. It can easily be purchased and taped together with good tape to make a good seal that all the filtration, it's almost as good as a HEPA filter. Uh, but it's not being done in most places. And it's not controversial. It's not a medical treatment. It shouldn't be controversial. It doesn't cost that much money. Like most families, you know, you can donate one to your school. Uh, it, sh it's, it should be pocket change compared to all the costs of school supplies and school infrastructure. But people, people are not doing this right now enough. You know, I can, be, I can go on. I'm incredibly frustrated and kids definitely need to be protected. Uh, in the U.S., because FDA has fully approved the Pfizer vaccine, you can technically now get it off-label in the U.S., um, but some people still have, are, are still holding out for data. But the data on kids under 12, the vaccine data for 5 to 11-year-olds, is not going to come out until the end of the year, unfortunately, because, you know, the, the delays in the data. So in certain ways, we can't wait for that. We need to vaccinate as many kids as we, um, possible, including the 12 to 15 year olds that are, there is good data for and should be vaccinated and don't use, you don't have enough, prioritize 
children especially, because I think the long-term damage, um, if obviously kids are our future, we know COVID has cognitive effects uh, on, on brain and uh, health. These things cannot be underestimated. And we have to prioritize masking, ventilation, air disinfection, um, which again, does not cost that much money if you use these Corsi boxes, Corsi Rosenthal boxes. Yeah. Um, it, they have to be prioritized in absence of vaccinations. The HEPA filters, the portable HEPA filters, I've, I've put three of them Personally, I put three of them in my kid's preschool, along with a CO2 detector. And the, the headmaster was, was delighted. Unfortunately, my other child in primary school, I tried to get asked to put it in and even organize parents to put them in all the classrooms, and he refused. But that's another story. But uh, I, I think this is critical. I mean, CO2 detectors help you detect whether you got good ventilation or not, and HEPA filters can, can remove a lot of it from the air. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me, I'm going to jump ahead here. There's a lot of questions I have, and, and uh, we're going to run out of time, though. But let me just stop for a second and, and say that, you know, Vet and Scops Forum runs on donations. We, we, we come with free, all sorts of free videos and so forth, but it, there, it comes with a cost of, of organizing and, and putting it together. So if you do get a chance and feel up to it, Please donate to Vet and Scops Forum. Uh, this is no, nobody's making money on this, but we just we need this to keep operating, and there should be a number at the end, bottom of your page for Swish. Uh, okay, with that piece of, of of responsibility out of the way, let me turn to a, a to the future. Uh, <clears throat> Well, let me just ask a very quick question. Bia Hortel asked, and I'm fascinated by this, does a breastfeeding baby benefit from the mother if she's vaccinated? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, the, because the mother will produce antibodies. Yeah. And the earlier she's vaccinated, so early vaccine or pre-pregnancy uh, vaccination is best because then you produce more at, uh, at delivery time. And, and also produce more in the breast milk after delivery. So earlier, the better. And a friend, Agnieszka, as well as Marianne Riltoff asked some questions about the future. You know, what do you think, they ask, you know, when do you think we'll be able to live our life as we used to? What, what do you see the future in, the, say, the next five years? You know, do you I think, think there needs to be a new normal? Twice a year or what? Hmm? Yeah, so I think, first of all, that... Uh, we may, depending on how Delta evolves, if there's more variants, um, we may need to get variant adapted uh, vaccines faster. Um, currently, we're still using the spike protein vaccines for the Wuhan 1.0 uh, strain. I think we have to update that. And they are working on it. Um, Eventually, you know, if we get the adaptive vaccines, then we should be good for a while. But the, I think there needs to be a new normal that um, we need like in better indoor air quality. I think I cannot emphasize, you know, years ago, we did not, you know, uh, prioritize water quality decades ago. And then we realized, whoa, water quality is really important. And then there's clean air. Clean air is really important because all the smog actually causes heart attacks and cancer and lung disease. So clean air. The, the one thing right now is that those are clean water and clean outdoor air, but there has not been a focus on clean indoor air. I think if we have a new frame of reference that indoor air is just as important, especially for uh, these viruses and other pathogens, that clean indoor air is just as important. I think we would be well on our way to returning to normal. But my worry is that this will be one of those things that's kind of ignored. Um, and I'm trying to fight for clean, cleaner indoor air because coronavirus, like many other viruses, are actually airborne. As we know from the ba big battle over droplets versus airborne transmission, the droplet people was based on old dogma, right? It's clearly airborne. So if we reshift our focus to clean air, indoor air, indoor air quality, beyond just smog levels, but actually refreshing the air, I think that will prevent tr transmission enormously. Um, 
and of course, virus surveillance and all these outbreak surveillance, which public health has been oftentimes ignored. There's way more money in medicine than there are in public health. Um, that's why there's, you know, hospitals have entire wings named after them. Um, but and hospital budgets are way more than, you know, actual prevention budgets of public health agencies. If we focus on prevention, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think that would also shift. But I worry about whether this will happen or not. But I think in order to return to normal, we have to focus on these public health infrastructure, focus on indoor air quality, or else we're going to be kind of, I think, stuck in a rut in which there could be future viruses that can emerge. You know, we're a much more international world than ever before, right? We trans, just compared to like air travel, if you look at the air travel volume in the last 20 years, it has increased exponentially, even in 20 years, not to mention 100 years since 1918. But even in 20 years, the amount of air and ground travel, and rail travel has enormously surged. Um, and I think obviously re remote telework is also becoming a more norm, but we don't really want that per se. We, we're still a very social species. So I think unless we recognize the these kind of pandemic mitigations and especially cross-border mitigations and health checks, um, we're going to be in a world of hurt for a while. And with wow. especially with Delta, Delta has taught us a lesson that we're you know, fancifully hoping that relying on vaccines alone without any other mitigations is a, is a pipe dream. Vaccines definitely work, but vaccines work only if everyone take it. If half the people don't take it, guess what? The, the virus will still overwhelm our, our country or in the world. Yep. Well, as you're, I'm sure you're aware that we're one of the very few countries in the world that does not recommend face masks usage. Almost no one uses them here. And Johanna Hug asked uh, uh, about the how, how to change the falsehood that has become a national truth in terms of this. And and Wendy Boyd Isaacson also says, why do you think that Swedish health authority still denies that COVID is airborne? and insist that face masks shouldn't be used at, at all in schools. And in fact, I should point out that Johanna and Wendy both point out that in some schools, they even forbid students or uh, forbade them to use them. I don't know if they're still doing that. I, I think not now, but but they certainly get, it's a stigmatized type of thing. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, what do you, I mean, this is similar to Canada, I think, in parts of Canada where they are denying uh, airborne transmission. What do you think is driving this? I think it's local leadership, local regional leadership that's so poor. Um, obviously, there I think there's lots of misinformation. Um, yeah. Some are just really bad leaders, but it's. I think in certain ways there's the hopeful, like you know, the ignoring of inconvenient truths, and I think there's very much politically motivated across the world. I've seen more right-wing governments. Now, by right-wing, I don't mean, you know, ultra right-wing, but even more right-wing governments and their policy appointees tend to be the ones who say, we don't need testing or we don't need masks. Uh, you know, we, we, the virus is not airborne, et cetera. Um, so I think in certain ways, you know, like, you know, Netherlands, in Belgium, Belgium is much more aggressive. Netherlands was not. Cases in Netherlands soared much worse. Hungary had a humongous winter surge um, as well. UK has obviously had a huge surge uh, because of its flirtation with, um, you know, no masks or flirtation with also actively saying kids don't need vaccinated or we don't, kids don't need masks in schools. And now look at the surge right now in the UK. And of course, in the United States, you know, the Republican uh, red states, the conservative states are doing horribly compared to the highly vaccinated, highly masked states in the North and the bluer states. Uh, so I think often that's political. You know, Eastern Canada is very different than, um, than Western and Central Canada, as we know. Uh, so 
it's it's certain ways it's very much local leadership of of bad advice a lot of these premiers and local governors and local ministers don't understand public health and their local health chiefs are you know by the way anyone can claim to be an epidemiologist <laughs> you can have a, a simple masters in public health and epidemiology but that doesn't mean you're really trained in pandemic preparedness uh, uh trained in you know really public health measures you know you just a lot hit of a nerve in sweden you just hit a nerve in sweden because oh yeah Anders Tegnell took four years to get a one-year distance epidemiology course finished <laughs> i didn't know that uh, well, no but like an mph there's many mphs just on a side note since this is an interesting topic on uh, scenes and is but there's mphs in you know uh health policy or MPHs in health um, decision analysis, this MPHs in, you know, social health, there's MPHs in almost anything. It, it, it's just the generic master's degree. It doesn't give you good insight, a deep insight. They're, they're not really research degrees. But a lot of uh, them who are usually MD MPHs, they have really just vague understanding of what it need what you need to do in a pandemic um they have no training in communications most of the time uh, especially the health ministers they have very little training in um in uh, research uh and in actually interpreting research or know how research can be biased there's lots of bad science out there too and so when when someone says follow the science they don't really know how to follow the actual science other than just parroting whatever they're they've been fed it's it's really frustrating in that sense, um, yeah. and uh, again, oftentimes they take cues from political leadership. Uh, these some of these health health ministers will just parrot whatever their governors or premiers or uh, you know ministers will tell them to to do, and it's incredibly incredibly frustrating because they don't understand about pandemic. There's no there's very few places with pandemic preparedness degrees, and even th then. Uh, um, most of them don't have training in aerosol transmission, right? Aerosol mm -hmm. transmission, as we know, is a domain of environmental engineering, not a domain of infectious disease and virology. Now, people think virologists are, know everything. Virologists, at the end of the day, are molecular biologists and geneticists of viruses. You know, they're not actually virus particle people, nor are they epidemiologists. I hate it when virologists and epidemiologists confuse. Um, and so there's a lot of, and I'm not trying to lane check credentialism because, you know, my training was in general epidemiology, but in terms of reading, how to read the data, training in communications, yeah. training in social behavioral health, behavioral economics, and public policy, pub where optics is almost just as important as the actual policy that you recommend. All these things are training are very interdisciplinary. And of course, aerosol transmission is a completely different environment engineering field that most public health people and most uh, virologists, epidemiologists have zero understanding about. Yeah. It is so interdisciplinary that, you know, a medical degree people have very little understanding of, of even these specific areas outside the field. And so no one knows everything. And so the best way is to learn how to synthesize from various fields, learn to, from different countries. And this is why in certain ways my Twitter is growing because I try to share lessons from different countries and say, based on what we're seeing in this country, this strategy is not working. Yeah. You know, Chile, what I yeah. highlighted, Chile relied on a vaccine only strategy. Their hospital eventually got overloaded because they only said, once we vaccinate, we don't do, need to do anything else. That should have been a warning sign for many other countries who took the same thing but ignored it. You know, I think that's the, the it's such a difficult pandemic. And a lot of people just are, do not have the knowledge savviness to synthesize information, or they have a way, a very convenient way to filter out whatever is inconvenient um, to their political agenda. And so I think here we are. We have lots of governments that are poorly run, a lot. Lots of provincial uh, uh, and city states that are just led by people who literally know nothing about actual pandemics.
Well, we have, I mean, we're sort of the opposite in Sweden because Tegnell has almost total power here. And Carlson, the head general director of the public health authority and the government just lets them do what they want more or less. But that's a, that's a, that's, but it's all in the end, it ends up being very similar. I have to comment because back earlier in this discussion, you talked about cherry picking and, and th this is a problem I see very strongly in that there's too many, both scientists who have ideologies, so they want to pick what they see or non-scientists who they read one paper and say, look here, this so shows something. And this is not how science works, okay? Science, you have to collect and look at all the data and all the papers. And people keep forgetting this. And this has been an enormous problem, in my opinion, at least on social media. Uh, and that's why I like your tweets, because there's always a long list of things, of multiple things. And and the few threads that I've made are always a whole bunch of papers, not, not just one. Yeah. There's a lot of mass studies that if you just cherry pick certain studies, you yeah. can cherry pick lots of bad, null mass studies while ignoring the, the you know, the confluence, the massive number of studies that show mass do work. That's right. And you can also find studies that show the earth is flat. So it's this. Uh, um, but let me, let me, we, we've only got a few minutes left and I've got two topics I want to cover. Uh, this, this is sort of a combination question from Elizabeth Wall and Klaus Riem. Hope I pronounced that right. But, uh, but I have to point it, Elizabeth had a very nice thing. She said, this forum with all its interesting guests is a place you can really truly experience joy and learning. And she says, thank you. I want to say thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, but what, in your opinion, you know, they're, they're both looking at the health authority, okay, and gaslighting us and, and told, telling us to wash our hands, okay, and, and forgetting about airborne infection and, and schools, okay, that, and, that do not have any precautions and so forth. Uh, what, what is your advice in terms of, I mean, the members of the Science Forum COVID-19 are among the more prominent scientists in the field, okay? And, uh, and yet they're not being listened to. The, the Royal Academy of Sciences, uh, which, which you know, I, I'm very familiar with because I'm in the Royal Academy, is, is, has put out some beautiful reports and they've been ignored. Uh, I wasn't part of those and, and my statements are not to be expressed as part of the Academy, but I, but I mean, but they, those reports are really very, very nicely done. And actually one of them more or less was calling for suppression, but they've been ignored. What, what's your advice in terms of trying to get authorities to listen to the scientists? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, I grappled with this because in many ways, science works when you publish and hopefully a policymaker grabs what you publish into the ether that, oh, this study shows this, lets you apply that into a future policy. That's how generally science pipeline works. The most science publish and hopefully policymakers use it. The pandemic has taught us very clearly, and um, well, may, highlighted the obvious that many of us have known that policymakers will cherry pick whatever they want to. Like if this is an inconvenience and stat about climate change, we're not gonna use it. Oh, if it's convenient for our agenda, we're gonna use it. And We've seen that over and over in climate science and, and also public health around nutrition as well, and many other things in, in uh, things that are basically inconvenient, they are suppressed. You know, opioids uh, causing a massive number of deaths, it doesn't happen, nothing happens until it boils into a crisis. So I think scientists have the wrong approach. They basically, um, right now, pee into the wind, hope, hoping political leaders listen. But the power not lies not among the scientists right now. The power lies in the political leaders. And right now, most scientists just beg for money from various government or nonprofit sources. Um, and they also, they when they publish, they beg someone to listen to them. But one thing you know in life that no one really... Uh, no one in power really listens to someone unless there's some sort of political power or leverage, right? And that's the honest truth. You know, political power comes with either leverage or the actual power, direct power to make laws and pass the laws if you have a majority. And so I think scientists need to wake up to that fact that, you know, public health is policy, policy is politics. So whenever some people tell me, oh, Eric, Oh, Eric, why are you so political? 
stay in your lane, be a scientist. Are you a politician? No, I'm not a politician. But in order to, for public health advice that saves lives to actually get to the part where it saves the lives, it must translate into policy, implemented via politics in getting that policy to work and instituted. That is what is the missing link for most scientists. These Royal Academy um, reports, now in, here in the US, National Academy reports. In the UK, these Public Health England reports and other scientific academia group op-eds and other reports, they have zero power unless they actually have either the personal ear of a minister who is favorable to them, or they actually have political power to change and build movements around people who demand it. Yeah. Um, and I think certain movement building is very important, but also that understanding that scientists have to roll up their sleeve into the realm of public health policy slash politics. Because unless you can institute your ideas into a law or regulations, um, it's peeing into the wind, honestly, yeah. uh, in terms of what most scientists are doing these days. And this is why in, you know, Twitter is powerful because it, the, it, it influences also media. And media also influences public momentum around a topic. And, and also oftentimes optics is, um, is just as important. Uh, so I think this is why how you try to affect policy because we wanna save lives, but just sitting back and writing an op-ed and saying finger whacking, this is not the, uh, a prudent approach that makes no difference unless you actually have direct political influence leverage or power to affect laws and regulations. Yeah, well, it, I mean, my fellow academy members need to understand this. They, we've had this argument. Some don't want us to speak up, but I mean, if you know you need to speak, that's always been my opinion. And I, I came out of the American system where that was something that changed some decades ago that, were, that, that scientists were to be more involved in public policy. Well, let me let me finish up. I have two quick questions. <laughs> Nothing's quick, but in this pandemic, but <clears throat> one of them relates to this exactly. And Maria Nielsen again, uh, she had several questions of which I've asked a couple. Uh, how much pressure politically is there on scientists in this pandemic? And and a big question from this is how can science keep its integrity? I mean, this is a big issue on on Twitter. Is what's what is happening to the integrity of scientists because there's a a lot of scientists that are ideologists, to be honest. Yeah, there are right-wing scientists, just like there are uh, left-wing scientists and, um, you know, politicians of all flavors, scientists of all flavors. And of course, a lot of them use, um, they drive whatever is convenient to their politics. Um, in certain ways, you know, although I have, you know, I'm a liberal in that sense, you know, I've not, as you know, I've not held back criticizing Biden CDC on whenever it made grave mistakes on masks, um, on other things related to the pandemic. I think, you know, I don't have good answers around this, around because politics have, you know, you can't, th these are personal biases. Um, and you can't really disentangle it telling, you know, certain, obviously censorship is, you know, problematic in, in the free, freedom of speech, uh, liberal democracies that we live in. But I think clearly when, you know, some people are talking complete nonsense or out of date information that, oh, it's not airborne, when it clearly it is airborne, <laughs> oh, masks don't work when clearly they do work, I think they have to be rightfully called out. Um, in, in medicine, you know, there's medical licensure. In epidemiology, here's the other thing. Anyone can claim to be an epidemiologist. There's no licensure um, for it, enforcing that you're an epidemiologist. Usually involves a degree. Um, but again, it's a very vague thing where people with an MPH can claim to be an epidemiologist. And there's no real, you know, this, in, in, in law, there's disbarment. If you break some legal ethics in medicine, there's, uh, you know, you can lose your license. Um, and in, in other 
areas, you know, obviously you lose popularity or you don't get reelected if you're a politician. Well, most of the time, unless you're in an ultra right wing district, in which you can say anything you want and you'll still get reelected, unfortunately, there's no accountability. And in certain ways, that's good for academic freedom where, you know, professors are tenured. But in other ways, it is also incredibly difficult. Um, you know, dangerous because it doesn't has no has no real checks. You know, some people said in January of, of 2020 that you know I was spreading misinformation. Um, actually, the, ironically, the reporter who wrote an article about that in two months, in two and a half months later, he apologized to me publicly, um, saying that you know I was wrong to write this article about Eric. But you know, the, the winds of the winds of what is true also changes in terms of, yeah. you know, this is going to be a thermonuclear level pandemic. Oh, he's spreading misinformation. You know, I think certain ways, some there are some people who um, were wrong on masks, like Fauci was mat- wrong on masks early on. The U.S. Surgeon General under Trump was wrong about masks. But then they admitted that they were wrong, right? Yeah. And because science updated. There are people right now who are still pro-anti-mask pro-natural infection herd, which we know is incredibly dangerous, um, and, you know, anti-airborne. At this point in stage, if you still are are on those, dug in those positions, and also opposing uh, vaccines and spreading misinformation about vaccines causing the virus and all that nonsense, there, there should be some sort of accountability where you're clearly against all the mountain of evidence that we've since collected. And I don't know what the accountability is around that, but um, I think I think you know universities for those in sciences should have some sort of form for evaluating that. That tenure should not protect you from public endangerment, right? Yeah. And uh, I think public endangerment traditionally was like, for example, um, drunk driving is public endangerment. But should we extend it to those who? willfully spread misinformation against all the recommendations. Uh, these are things that we will have to actively debate. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying there should be a Nuremberg trials, and I don't think we should have those, but we should actively debate who who's messaging in the middle of the pandemic, especially one year into the pandemic or more, actively, clearly try to undermine public health efforts. And I think there should be some sort of public, you know, accountability, you know, forum on these, like, a, you know, kind of like, a, you know, in the US, what we call the 9-11 report style report in which yeah. what went what went wrong. And I That's think right. there should history should have a good accounting of remembering who in the pandemic were helpers and who clearly were fighting, um, fighting against public health. Okay, well, let's just end with a with a quick question. Okay, uh, Yanir po- tweeted last night that UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson this week has been reported to say that it's okay if a thousand people die from COVID every week. No action will be taken to prevent it. Do you yeah. have a comment? What do you think of that? Well, um, I would like to quote Dr. Mike Ryan when he was asked about UK's uh, mass infection strategy and reopening. And basically, Dr. Mike Ryan said, it is mass infection is not okay. It is morally empty and epidemiologically stupid for anyone to suggest that. And I think the morally empty part of allowing a thousand people to die a day of COVID is just so spot on. And I think- A week, week. he said a week, yeah. A thousand a week, yeah. Yeah, it it is just so morally empty that we cannot, I can't can't fathom to that this is okay. You know, let them, basically it's a let them die. You know, I I don't think, uh, you know, you know, social Darwinism is is an okay thing. I believe that everyone should have a chance to live, and everyone should uh, sh- we should live in a society where the prote- government protects us from these dangerous things that causes a thousand people to die a week. Um, and I'm pretty sure 
not a thousand people die a week of car accidents, right? And we should build safer roads, prevent drunk driving. We have all these things, you know, better signages that and, and, and traffic lights at places that have a lot of accidents. We have to we have to mitigate. We cannot just say that this is acceptable in our society, you know, especially if we can afford to stop it. And there are known strategies to stop it. <sighs> okay. Well, I promised you an hour and we're an hour and 10 minutes. It's been really, really a great honor and pleasure to speak with you, Eric. Uh, thank, thank you so much. This, this pandemic should have lasted two months, but we're, we're, over a year and a half. <laughs> so running over right now is, is kind of normal. But um, I hope everyone stays safe. I hope everyone realizes that, you know, public health is policy, is politics, and will stand up to fight and lend their voices to make it known that it is not okay to be morally empty and epidemiologic stupid in this pandemic still. Okay, very well put. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Okay, you too.